Professor Simon Tay, Singapore Institute of International Affairs, Pak Nazir Fuad, Peat Restoration Agency Indonesia, Dr. Mulaman Haddad, Chairman, Financial Services Authority Singapore, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here at the third Singapore Dialogue on Sustainable World Resources. This dialogue was inaugurated in 2014 and has grown in stature and scale and playing a very significant role in bringing together the relevant stakeholders together in a conference like this to discuss key environmental and sustainability issues. I'm, see, I'm happy to see many regional players here, speakers coming from all over our region. And I think we have a common objective, which is how do we see our region thrive, but at the same time also observe the importance to ensure that it is sustainable and contributing towards sustainable development. One key contributor to economic well-being in Southeast Asia, as we all know, is a viable and sustainable agroforestry sector. And there's good prospect in this sector. But to achieve its true prosperity for the people in the region, we all have begun to realize that the agroforestry sector needs to pursue its economic ambitions in an environmentally sustainable way. Let me take palm oil cultivation as an example. It has enabled many local people to improve their lives. It plays a vital role in a global economy and is used widely in everyday, everyday products that many of us may not even realize. Cosmetics, food, just to name a few. Surpassing, indeed, surpassing other oil crops as mentioned by the panel just now, it requires, therefore, less land to produce the same amount of oil that other oil products will produce for us. But unsustainable land clearing practices such as burning of forests and peatland risk giving the entire industry a bad reputation and palm oil consequentially can also be affected. And therefore, that will threaten the long-term viability of the sector because consumers and investors will feel compelled to distance themselves from the sector and from the product. Inevitably, to do well in the long term, agroforestry companies need to pursue sustainable growth growth that take into account environmental and other important concerns. Let me highlight some practical measures that all agroforestry companies should implement now as part of their commitment to sustainable growth. First, agroforestry companies should take full responsibility for fire prevention and mitigation in their concessions. There must not be a repeat, for example, of last year's fires because the prolonged season of dryness has continued, has allowed fire to burn uncontrollably and in a very widespread way. Second, companies should also invest in efforts to rehabilitate degraded and fire-prone pitlands. We laud the appointment of Pak Nazir by the government of Indonesia to look at rehabilitation of pitlands in Indonesia. We cannot afford to have massive releases of carbon that negate global efforts to combat climate change as what has happened last year. Third, companies must ensure that sustainable policies and practices don't just stop with them. But they must also look at how the whole entire chain affect their reputation as well as the products they produce for their end consumers. Just last week, Unilever, Mars and Kellogg cancelled their products with a major palm oil producer following the suspension of the company's certification by RSPO. 
The government lauds the efforts of these companies in taking proactive steps to incorporate environmental sustainability into their entire supply chain and operations. What measures can we take to prevent the recurrence of last year's fire? I've highlighted in my Community of Supply speech just a few days ago that this requires a multifaceted approach from all stakeholders. I will summarize three of them and expand the other three. What are the three that I will, I will summarize? First, to actively promote regional cooperation because haze is a multilateral issue. Second, to continue to support Indonesia's effort to tackle the haze. And therefore, just yesterday, Pak Jokowi's announcement to freeze have a moratorium against new concessions for palm oil and mining land is certainly laudable. Third, as customers and consumers, all of us can influence the agroforestry industry through our own purchasing decision. Let me now expand on the other three. I would like to emphasize that the government is, spark, is sparing no efforts to address the commercial routes of transboundary haze by pursuing errant companies under Singapore's Transboundary Haze Pollution Act, or THPA. NEA, our National Environment Agency, served notices under Section 10 and 11 of the THPA recently on a foreign director when he was in Singapore. These notices require him to provide information relevant to the haze attend an interview in relation to the ongoing investigations. In accordance to the law, we will take every necessary step to enforce the THPA, bearing in mind that outside of Singapore, there can be limited possibilities. But we will hold any Singaporean companies and entities to account. At the same time, if the errant companies' directors, even if they're foreigners, coming through Singapore, we will take action and we have to comply with the laws of our country. The THPA has also given us the, the tools to be effective in getting companies to take notice and to take action. I note that some prominent agroforestry companies have frankly taken out advertisements, gone on radio shows to show that they are doing something and this goes to show that companies like this have set up and taken notice of our actions through the THPA. My message to all these companies is simply this. Companies practicing unsustainable production that affect us with the haze must know that their actions will not lead to profitability and they will have to face the consequences sooner or later. Let me now touch on how civil society can play its role in promoting a sustainable agroforestry industry. First and foremost, civil society is a key enabler to foster an informed consumer movement and strengthen support for sustainably sourced products. Second, civil society plays a critical role in enhancing the transparency and accountability of companies and governments, in enhancing their supply chain management and thereby enabling consumers and investors to give greater support to sustainable businesses and industry. As consumers, we have choices. We make our choices count. When the heat, haze hit Singapore last year, there was noticeable ground off movement, something we have not seen ever. As mentioned by Chairman Isabella Lo just now, the Singapore Environment Council instituted a temporary restriction on the use of green label by Asia Pulp and Paper, APP, in October last year. And together with the Consumer Association of Singapore, CASE, jointly led a movement to advocate against unsustainable practices. Consequently, large supermarket chains in Singapore, like NTUC, Fairprice, Sing Siong, and Prime Supermarket, responded 
by removing all APP products from their shelves, while the dairy farm group stopped the purchase of all APP products. Organizations such as World Wildlife Fund Singapore, People's Movement to Stop Haze, PM Haze, and the Singapore Institute of International Affairs also jointly organized the, what they call We Breathe What We Buy a campaign to increase public awareness on the sustainability of agro-industry products. These actions demonstrate the significant power of a collective, collective consumer voice and an increasingly active and empowered consumer movement led by civil society. Recently, a report by Indonesian activist group Eyes on the Forest highlighted that while companies have made commitments to stop deforestation, their supply chains remain tainted with palm oil grown on protected land with fragile ecosystems that are home to endangered Sumatran tigers, orangutan, and elephants. This demonstrates the crucial role again that civil society plays in bringing malpractices to light and enhancing the transparency of supply chains and accountability of companies in the palm oil and agro and forestry sectors. One such area relates to the transparency of information on concessions and hotspots. Where progress on ASEAN efforts such as the Regional Haze Monitoring System has been slow, NGOs have been quick to find a solution to this. The Global Forest Watch, spearheaded by the World Resources Institute, has helped to improve the transparency of forest management and commodity production through its tied up with the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, or RSPO, on maps of certified sustainable palm oil production sites. More recently, Greenpeace Indonesia launched a public GIS portal, Peta Kepo Hutan, which overlays concession information with various official sources, allowing tracking of fires on different concession types from palm oil to logging, wood fiber, and mining concessions. A useful feature is that Peta Kepohuta now allows the identification of companies that own such concessions. Another area relates to eco-certification. This enables consumers to readily identify sustainably sourced products. Last year, the RSPO announced RSPO Next a voluntary addendum to its existing principles and criteria for certification. It's an initiative to encourage RSPO member country, companies that have met the current requirements of the RSPO to exceed these requirements. This is a good initiative, and I hope companies will respond positively. Nevertheless, I would not want to paint an overly optimistic picture. Currently, only 21% of global palm oil is currently certified by RSPO. And there's a lot of work required to increase demand for sustainable palm oil, as well as for certification of supply chains. Hence, I'm glad that the SEC has recently launched a new category under the Singapore Green Label Scheme for products containing palm oil that builds on the RSPO certification. I'm also happy to note the significant progress made in the area of pulp and paper products. In October last year, SEC and CASE stepped up the engagement efforts by getting leading supermarkets, as I mentioned, and also pharmacies, furniture retailers, with paper products certified under Singapore Green Labeling Scheme, or SGLS, administered by the SEC to declare that they had not procured or used wood products, paper, or pulp for, from unsustainable practices or sources. As part of its continuous efforts to help the public identify environmentally friendly products and enhance eco-consumerism, SEC has just announced that it's now taking it further and working on a new category for products with pulp and paper, which will include in its criteria the requirement for peatland management and fire prevention standards. When fully developed, I believe this standard will be the most holistic certification standard for pulp and paper in the world. It will be a tool that empowers consumers to make a very safe, non-haste, pro-conservation 
choice for sustainable paper products. This will not only be very good for Singapore, but can also set standard for global consumers. I commend SEC for taking the initiative. I also strongly encourage companies which have not practiced or not participated in the SGLS to be part of the certification. And as consumers, we should now start buying and using products from companies that have pledged to be socially responsible. The Singapore government will also do its part as a major consumer. From the third quarter of 2016, the government will only procure printing paper products that carry the Singapore Green Label. We'll also spearhead efforts in fighting climate change by procuring electric products that have been certified as being highly energy efficient. Through our efforts, we hope to spur individuals and businesses to likewise make a deliberate choice to support environment sustainability. My final point is on the pivotal role that the financial sectors play in advancing and raising the bar on sustainable financing and investment practices. There's a growing recognition that adopting environmental, social and corporate governance, or ESG, practices positively affect long-term risk-adjusted returns and high ESG ratings. More often than not, correlates with a lower cost of capital. It's a sustainable way to run businesses and a hedge against reputational and environmental risk. Banks and investment institutions will therefore be promoting their clients' interests by encouraging the wider adoption of ESG practices. At the height of the Hayes episode last year, Association of Banks in Singapore, or ABS, issued its guideline on responsible financing. Specifically, banks in Singapore are required to disclose their commitment to responsible financing, publish their policy framework, and implement governance systems by 2017. The three local banks, DBS, OCBC, and UOB, have issued commitments to responsible financing in their respective annual reports released recently. The ABS is also actively engaging the industry to raise awareness and build capacity on sustainable financing. Earlier this month, the ABS and WWF conducted capacity building workshops to prepare the industry for the implementation of the ABS guidelines. On the capital markets front, SGS will be introducing sustainability reporting on a comply or explain basis. And had in February this year concluded its public consultation on the proposed rules and guidelines. SGX expects the new rules and guide on sustainability reporting to apply to companies from the financial year ending on or after 31st December 2017, with reports published from 2018. These are all positive steps, and I encourage our financial sectors to take even bolder measures to support, to support sustainability in line with international best practices. Internationally, there are encouraging signs that major international investors are distancing themselves from unsustainable business practices. For example, Norway's government pension fund Global, GPFG, well, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund recently dropped 11 companies because of connections to de deforestation. There are also efforts underway by international bodies. The UN Environment Programme launched its first report on its inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system last October. The report discussed how the full potential of the financial system can be harnessed and policy options that could mobilize capital to sustainable development and towards a green and inclusive economy. Second, the Financial Stability Board, FSB, has announced the launch of the industry-led Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Risk Disclosures, chaired by Michael Bloomberg. The Task Force will develop voluntary, consistent climate-related financial risk disclosures for use by companies. Singapore's, Singapore Exchanges Yo Lian Sim is the vice chair of this task force, 
which held its second meeting last month in Singapore. The task force is currently working on developing specific recommendations in consultations with key stakeholders and will deliver to the FSB this report by December 2016. With China holding the G20 presidency this year, it has made green financing a core part of its agenda. China has set up the Green Finance Study Group, GFSG, which countries like Singapore and Switzerland are part of. Germany has also agreed to carry the theme of green finance on the G20 agenda through, their, through to their presidency in 2017. Banks and central banking authorities in the region have also progressed. In November 2015, Autoritas Jasa Kewangan, OGK, the Central Bank of Indonesia released its Sustainable Finance Roadmap, covering areas such as microfinancing, capital markets, SME lending, pension funds, and insurance. The Sustainable Finance Roadmap comes with timeframes and deliverables driven by market-based incentives. OGK has also announced its collaboration with the WWF to launch an 18-month project to help Indonesian banks integrate ESG criteria in its credit approval framework. Just last month, Bank Mandiri, Indonesia's largest bank, announced that it will tighten credit loans to oil palm plantations, and new loans to finance development of new oil palm plantations in pitlands will be ceased. These efforts are testament to the commitment, the sum of all our efforts, international, regional bodies, and our own domestic financial institutions in promoting the cause of sustainability. Our financial institutions can and should continue to exercise influence over forestry and palm oil companies and promote the adoption of sustainable practices by factoring sustainability issues into their lending and investment policies. To bring about a more sustainable agroforestry sector, we will need all stakeholders, consumers, investors and lenders, and business themselves to move ahead together. We cannot expect transformational changes overnight. Together, the different actors within the ecosystem must collectively step up efforts, even as we know that challenges abound. The Government of Singapore has taken a stand and we hope to have you along with us on the journey towards sustainability. Let's all work together towards clear skies and clean air for all, now and into the future. In closing, let me congratulate SIIA for organising this event as it has also been active on his front through its diplomacy and networking efforts and the regular commentaries on his that it publishes. Thank you all and I wish you a lively, constructive discussion ahead.